Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Shots Fired Podcast. Episode 61, doing things a little bit differently today. Today, I've got two friends in studio, Justin Bridges and Nick Oldwin. Um, if you guys are wondering who these guys are, Mark is actually in Nashville partying. He felt that was more important. So we wanted to make sure that we still put out some content for you guys. Um, so I asked a couple friends to come in and do this. Both have an interesting background in law enforcement. Uh, we're going to get into that. Justin has been on the show in the past. I don't remember what episode it was, but we were operating out of my kid's bedroom. We were there. So Justin's a pro. Um, he's, I guess we could call him the fill-in co-host. Non-ginger fill-in co-host. Yeah, the non-ginger, non-bearded uh, fill-in co-host. And then we've got Nick Oldwin here with us. Uh, Nick, thanks for popping in here, dude. You're welcome. Nick's got an interesting background. Uh, before becoming a police officer, how long have you been a cop? Uh, 10 years. Okay. So yeah. before being a cop, Nick was a defense criminal investigator. So he worked for the dark side <laughs> prior to, to being a cop, became a detective, very successful at that. I thought it would be cool to uh, bring Nick in and talk about, um, you know, the other side of, of the job, the defense side and things that you guys looked for. Um, you, your, was it your dad, right? That ran a successful. Yeah. Criminal defense uh, lawyer. Okay. Um, Interesting stuff. So I've, I've chatted with you a little bit about it before. I don't think we've gone like super in depth about it, but, um, I know that that was like a big part of your life and then your dad passing away and yeah, how that affected you. So yeah, let's get into it. So we're going to talk about that. Um, but before we get started, guys, we want to give a shout out to our sponsors as always tack ops. Thank you, uh, for always supporting the show. You guys have been supporting the show early on. We can't thank you guys enough. Um, TAC Ops puts on three amazing conferences a year for all tactical SWAT stuff related. Make sure you guys jump over to SWATconference.org. If you guys haven't been to a conference, I would highly suggest going. You've got, uh, New York, Washington, DC, and Nashville. And we're very fortunate that we're able to attend all of them. So we'll be there. Uh, we just, had the New York conference, very successful. And then now we're going to be heading to Nashville at the end of August. So get over there, get signed up. I promise you, you guys won't, uh, it, it won't disappoint you. Um, can't forget about arrest my vest, head over to arrestmyvest.com. It's summertime. Your vest probably stink. You probably stink after the end of your shift. <laughs> um, get yourselves uh, the number one selling deodorizer. And then, um, if you guys are looking for training, Obviously, big supporters of Savage Training Group. Go to savagetraininggroup.com. Sign up for their classes. They're all over the country, guys. They are, I think, one of the best, if not the best, training law enforcement training group in the country right now. They're very up to date and modern with stuff. In fact, we've had a couple of their instructors on, and we have another instructor coming on um, here at the beginning of July. So, savagetraininggroup.com. Get signed up. Their classes are amazing. All right, guys. Hey, um, again, thank you both for being here. I know both of you work today. I uh, appreciate it. Um, hey, listen, all three of us have worked with each other for a long time. So this is kind of cool to, to be in here and doing this, this podcast together. Nick, you've been secretly wanting to come on for a long time now. <laughs> um, so here, here we have you in the studio. Like, what do you think so far of like, of uh, all this. This is incredible. It's uh, way more professional than I thought. Knowing you, I thought yeah. it would just be like held up with, you know, gum and duct tape. Well, some gel. of it is. Some hair of it gel. is. Hair gel. Yeah. <laughs> yeah some 100% of it is, but, hair gel. Yeah. But uh, no, this is legit. This is, uh, I'm, I'm really impressed. And uh, you actually asked me to come on and then promised me I, I was going to come on. I did. So then I just followed up. I did gift you guys both with uh, an infamous yes. Shots Fired podcast. But then he invited me first. That is true. That's just Justin saying. was That's a okay. first timer. Don't worry about it. No big deal. Every time I tell a like story, so so Nick and I, um, we worked patrol together for a while uh, mm -hmm. on the same patrol team. Yep. And uh, you, Nick and I have been involved in some stuff together. Um, and, and we were in an OIS together some years ago. So um, I don't know. I thought maybe we could share some, uh, maybe the listeners want to hear some of our little personal stories before we kind of dive into like the topics that we want to talk about. And Justin was an FTO for a long time. Um, just left FTO and patrol to now you're in detective. So you're kind of doing that role. It's, it's, it's been a, uh, adjustment to go from a graveyard 
patrol officer slash FTO to a day shift detective. <laughs> well, you're always talking uh, about too, like you feel like a completely different person. Oh, it's, uh, I love, I love graveyard patrol. It's still something that I desire to do, but now that my internal clock is completely shifted, dude, I'm in bed like eight thirty, nine o'clock. Did you go back? <sighs> Dude, you got to admit that's the, a hard one. The, the work that's a hard one. I love it. I, I love that. I, I mean, I, I do not get the same adrenaline rush and the same, like you hear the tones come out or you see the, the red call hit the board or the priority call hit the board. And you re- quickly read that. And all of a sudden those wheels in the grease starts going. Let me going. tell you about the first time the tones went off when Bridges came back to detectives, he's grabbing <laughs> his, his tack vest. He's ready to go. He's running out. And I, You're I mean, all whoa, bro. Yeah, it was. that was me. I mean, I it happens it. to us all, you know, my, my former partner, same thing. Hey, yeah. you can pump the brakes. There's, there was a, I think a shooting across from San Juan. It was the and I'm, I'm throwing everything on doing the same thing. And I immediately remembered the just, you bang to 11. I yeah. hear it. I'm like, let's go. Yeah, I'm like, hold on, man. It's yeah. yeah. It was yeah. hard. It was hard, but I, I mean, I get it. We have to be there to investigate it. Right. We're not part of it anymore. We're the kind of the, the cleanup crew afterwards to make sure everything gets buttoned up and done. Um, it's, I love it. It's very different than what I was used to. Um, but I hope that everybody experiences different, uh, opportunities within law enforcement career because that's super important i never thought about that actually now that you guys say that like being a detective back there um listening to like those calls go on and you're listening to patrol or whoever yeah. handle it I, I feel like that would be kind of tough to just like listen to these things kind of evolve now obviously i guess if it was something so extreme that like you're sure. gonna go absolutely shooter, yeah, things you're like gonna that, go you're on I your get way that. but absolutely but like the bank oh, robbery yeah. is a good one because are you're going responding as though you're going to catch a bank robber in action or chase them down or do something. If you approach them, our mindset is more of, okay, let's start thinking what evidence is going to be there. Fingerprints. Let's start looking at, Hey, you know, cameras yeah. and things that we're going to get traffic it's, cameras, it's a completely different mindset. Yeah. yeah. And you have to, it's a tough one. And so I think it was, I don't know, probably your first month in, not even. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I can't dive too deep into it because it's still an active uh, case, but that was it. We, we sat back, we started looking at traffic cameras, LPR license plate reader cameras, um, and gathering up as much information prior to, obviously we still went to the location, but, um, yeah, you're doing, but you're doing this all like ahead of time. Absolutely. So once, once we hear it, once we see it, patrol officers who obviously in their cars significantly closer to the incident than we are, um, are responding to it. We're gathering some information to preload ourselves before we, before we go dude, out isn't there. that crazy though? Like what we have access to now, like dude, imagine having to do this. We have, I mean, cameras now are like insane, right? We're like we have like real time crime centers where like guys are literally and gals are watching this stuff live on all these cameras around the city. Imagine 10 years ago when that didn't exist and be, or being a detective 20 years ago. When, yeah. when I, I first imagine. started investigations as a whole, one of the first cases I worked, we had Polaroid pictures. Yeah. So I know an an agency gave me Polaroid pictures as there. That's how they took evidence. I mean, so you could see where in 20 years where we've come. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You you had to be cautious of how much, you know, well, and people think too, it's like taking people think too, with all these cameras and stuff like big brother, it's not that at all. Like these cameras are solving cases so fast. Like you're able to lock down a suspect just by the mere fact of having these cameras out there. I mean, no, I can, and, and listen, if you're not a cop and you're listening to this, like we can assure you nobody is monitoring these cameras, no. trying to get any information about you that we don't need. Like it, that's not the purpose behind it. Yeah. It's, we got enough to do without no. having to worry about everybody. Yeah. Else. yeah. You hear that, but man, that would be, that would be crazy. They're, they're doing things where they are starting to use those cameras and using the data from them to anticipate where the suspects are going to be. Yeah. After they flee. So the cops are no longer chasing. They're just waiting for yeah. That's like the next level stuff. And that you're, you're seeing that in agencies, you know, up and down California. And that's, that's the goal, right? I mean, why chase them? And, yeah. you know, and I mean, I can't speak for obviously all the agencies that, that have access to this, but like you said, Kyle, we're not using this for the, you know, the soccer mom that ran a no, red light. By all means, you know, we're, we're, we're truly that. chasing people that have proven that there cannot be effective members of society. Yeah. And we, and we are with the assistance of these cameras, tra- tracking them down quicker and 
putting them where they need to be quicker than we would without it. Totally. So I think that's, I think that's a super important to put out there. Can, can we just talk about the, um, I don't know if it was, I know you were new in detectives and it was, um, it seems like we've had a bunch of bank robberies lately, but it may have been the first bank robbery that you went to uh, some months ago. And what happened on the way to oh. this bank robbery? <laughs> Justin, I don't, I don't, oh, wait, 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 this is, I was on the phone. Yeah. I was on my Bluetooth. Yeah. Yeah. It was it wasn't a bank robbery. It was a bank robbery. I think it was. I it, was, it, was the, our first. it was the final one of that series. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah. It was, it was one guy going around doing this bank robbery. Because we were series. we were coming in for for the yeah. uh the so yes. we, it was the end of our shift. So if you're all wondering, Justin crashed his car before he even got there. <laughs> but go ahead. It was it yeah, it was a crash. It was but it it and it was my fault. And uh, what was the first thing I said to you when we were on the phone? <laughs> so the, 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 the shitty part or the, the bad part with that, this whole situation is, is I wasn't even on call that day. If somebody else was on call, which would be Nick, but it was my series of crimes that I was investigating. And uh, so I responded and <laughs> I'm on the phone with Nick. And uh, yeah, I, I crashed my patrol or said, my take home car. You were on Bluetooth, right? That's what <laughs> oh, I swear, I swear, <laughs> oh, hand yeah. to God. That was the first question. And then I said, are you okay? But yeah, everyone was okay. Nobody was hurt. It was, it was a, a little, it was bender. a little minor fender bender. Just a little but, excited. Uh, You're just, you know excited. what? I, I will pat myself on the back because I got through that, responded and uh, solved the crime. So yeah. everyone, I was the patrol sergeant. Everyone kept hitting me up. They're like, you need to call Justin, make sure he's okay. I'm like, dude, he's fine. Like I remember calling him. Have like, you ever wrecked a car? I'm like, what? Uh, no, actually I haven't. Well, Knock on wood. I haven't. I got hit by a drunk driver. I mean, but that obviously wasn't my fault. Yeah. Other than that. No, I think you've talked about that one. Getting hit by a drunk driver. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it almost killed How me. How about you? No, I've never wrecked a car. Cool. Nice so, guys. Thanks hey, for covering it's, me. It's good to be unique. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> better knock on wood. Yeah. Dude. yeah I, I'm in a, <clears throat> in a much less stressed position now. So it's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, shoot. Um, let's, let's, let's get into a couple of the topics we, we wanted to talk about. We, we get a lot of, uh, or we have a lot of younger cops, I think, listen to the show. And, um, Justin, before we get into Nick's background, I wanted to hit on Justin, your background and, and F, being an FTO because you did it for so long and you worked, we worked together. You worked on my patrol shifts and I always thought you were a top notch FTO and a lot of guys learned from you. And I know that, in the FTO program, if guys were, or gals were struggling, I know that you were like one of those guys that the FTO supervisor would put them with you to, you know, to evaluate them, figure out their struggles. And I don't know, I started 16 years ago when I started, man, it was like, dude, you, you got, I don't want to say treated like shit, but it was more focused on, I think, stress, like inducing Absolutely. a shit ton of stress into you and almost like a rite of passage. Yeah, um, like my FTOs would like smack me upside the head yeah. and yell at me oh, and make you and get if out you and were run. Failing, yeah, and if you were failing, yeah, get out of the car and go see which street yeah. you know we're on. Which which cool. I, I like. I think there's a time and place for that. Absolutely. But I, agree. but I think we're kind of evolving now, and there is a newer generation of cops coming up. Um, I don't know. Could, could we talk a little bit about that? And like, what did you see um, as an FTO? And then um, maybe how you would made some adjustments to be able to teach somebody that may have been struggling in certain areas. So, so it's, you know, it's, that's a tough question because that could probably, we could probably talk about that literally all night long. Um, you know, younger, what I'm finding is that the officers that are coming in fit kind of fall into one category, either like pretty young. When I say pretty young, I mean, early twenties, um, probably just out of college or kind of, you know, first true career path or somebody that's a little older that's like, hey, this is what I want to do now. Um, and I think when I started this, I was kind of somewhere in between. Oh, you don't have, yeah, go ahead. I was taking this photo. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so the, the, the younger crowd, I find that, you know, cell phones have really kind of taken over their ability to communicate. Yeah. As true. far as like one-on-one -on -one, face to face. Yeah, for sure. Um, so what I found is just getting them out there talking to people in less stressful events and kind of seeing how they communicate and find out like who, where, kind of where their niche is. Cause ultimately we, you know, as a FTO, we want to teach them to function in the, you know, shittiest of moments, right? When yeah. those, um, when the proverbial shit hits the fan, they when need to be able to function, mm -hmm. right? Um, at least enough to get through the incident and, and, and uh, you know, respond with their partners act with their partners. Um, so communication's huge. 
Um, so as young officers, what I've, or young people that want to come into this industry and, uh, which I highly recommend it's as much as I love it, you know, it, it's hard to, much as I love being a detective, it's hard not, not doing patrol. Yeah. Um, I'm working some overtime here coming up. So it's day shift though. So <laughs> it's not great. Jaren. Um, just talk to people. Don't, uh, get rid of the text, go out and talk to people, whether it's, Hey, for a summertime job, find go door to door sales. You're going to be the biggest asshole in every single neighborhood, knocking on people's doors. And you're going to find every single reason to not talk to these people, but talk to them because those are the exact people that you're going to be dealing with when you're responding out to calls. Yeah. Do you guys, I think society wise, like a lot of, um, I see a lot of cops putting blame on these younger generation cops, not knowing how to be able to talk to people, but I don't think that people are really kind of peeling it back and understanding why is that? And you, you mentioned the cell phone thing. I mean, I don't think it's really their problem. I think it's just uh, the generation they've grown up in with Absolutely. the cell phone. It's the culture. I mean, it yeah. is what, that's how we communicate. I mean, you guys have kids that are old enough yeah. to have their own phones. I mean, no. that's how they're communicating, right? Yeah. Snap or we didn't have any of that or Instagram. Up. Yeah. No, I mean, so, I forced my kids last summer to go out and knock on doors and paint address signs on curb lines. They made a little extra money. They kind of understand the value of a dollar, but what I was doing it for is to force them to go out and actually have face to face communication with people. Um, Ultimately, you know, they're going to be applying for jobs, applying for colleges, talking to people. And I'd much rather have them ready for that than unprepared and, you know, have to communicate through a text. Yeah. So do you think that'd be like your number one tip for like, <clears throat> we get a lot of messages from guys that are wanting to be cops or they're, they're in the academy and they're actually about to start FTO and they're always like, Hey, like, what can I expect? What, you know, what can <clears throat> better prepare me? Would your answer be? um, the communication piece or absolutely. I, I would, I guess I would say yes, because failure to be able to communicate leads to a lot of things. It leads to the inability to control a situation leads to the inability to, you know, act when it becomes time to act, whether it means put somebody in handcuffs or put hands on people. Um, you know, so it being able to communicate gets you out of a lot of stuff and, you know, Every senior officer will tell you, I'd much rather talk somebody into handcuffs than actually fight somebody and put them in handcuffs. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the de-escalation is Absolutely. such a huge part. The communication is what leads to that. I mean, it's, you just don't see it. These kids, they, they kind of just stop. There's not, yeah. there's not a process, you know, that OODA loop you hear, right? They get into the, put your hands behind your back, put your hands behind your back, put your, you know, and like, they don't know that next step. Yeah. You know, and Nick's old because you referred to them as the kids. Well, dude, like, <laughs> the kids. they are young. I mean, and it's not just like, look, there's people listening to this that, that I know for a fact are probably just as frustrated as we are getting these such young cops with not a, lot, a lot of life experience. Like, look guys, I've traveled all over the country training at different departments and talking to a lot of other cops. It's, it's everywhere. It's like a nationwide, I don't even want to call it a problem, but it's, it's just like the new reality is we, this is the new generation of people that we're getting to be police officers. Like you started, you both started actually a little later yeah. in life, mm -hmm. right? I was 30. Yeah. So, I mean, and I was 20 when I started. So to me, it's Maybe. like normal, but, but I obviously like knowing what I know now, looking back, I think that's, probably a little way too young to be a cop. I would agree. At this point, <laughs> it is what it is. That's who we're getting. And so um, I, I think, and, oh, and then to top that off, like the people training the cops now are like, what, two, three years on yeah, you're getting, that are being, at, that are getting yeah. selected as FTOs. As important as it is to, you know, talk to, I think on here, talk to the, to the young officer that wants to become a cop or that is in the process of FTO. I think it's important to address young FTOs as well, because you know, you're, you're in this capacity where you feel like you control this person's career path and in a way you do, but at the same time, if, if they're having issues functioning and being able to communicate and be failing to engage, it's your responsibility as their trainer to say, Hey, this isn't this, Hey, Sarge or whoever's running the FTO program, this, you know, this person's not cutting it. They're, yeah. they're a liability to themselves, to the department. And as, as horrible as it sounds, you are, affecting this person's future, but you could potentially saving their life as well. So that, that's super important as well. Yeah. And it's tough too, because you get guys that, you know, patrol cops that get frustrated with trainees and they're probably talking shit to their FTO. Like, dude, you got to cut this guy. But in all reality, like now kind of being in a manager's position and then kind of seeing behind the scenes, like 
you, you really do want to give people the benefit of the doubt because think, how, I mean, do you know how much money is invested in these people and, oh. and not only money, but like, you know, staffing, mm -hmm. I mean, Time, it, energy, I mean, everything, yeah. it, it affects everybody down the chain. So, you know, if you're wondering why it's not as easy to just boot someone to the curb, Absolutely. I mean, you, you do want to give them as much investment as you possibly can within reason absolutely within reason and then and then at the end of the day if it still doesn't work at least you can say like dude we did everything we could to, to try to make this work mm -hmm. and it's not working and really i think what it boils down to is you're not doing it because you don't like the person it's because at least the way i see it is you don't want to see that guy get hurt um and you don't want to see somebody else get hurt as a result of their lack of failure so it is what it is yeah we've all said it like a lot of people want to be cops do law enforcement, but it's not for everybody. No, Absolutely. And, and, it's, and it's, you know, better to find it out sooner than later. Yeah. We all know cops that have been five, six years in and you're like, this is just not for you, but what is he going to do now? You know, it's, it's hard to get out of that yeah. when you've been in it for that long. Well, it, I think it's also important as from an FTO perspective to understand a, a mental mistake versus a, you know, an officer safety mistake. You know, I'll kind of fall on my sword here. I don't think I've ever, I didn't talk about this last time I was here, but uh, my very first day of FTO, I was at a different agency. I, uh, you know, night before, it was like Christmas Eve, right? Getting everything ready, laying everything out. Shirts pressed, pants look great. Boots shined, looking spectacular. Belt ready, all set up. I leave for work. My commute's an hour and a half. I get there. I left my boots at home. Oh, shit. <laughs> I it's better like, than your gun. Yeah, dude, that. I felt, I'm like, holy, what do I do? And so I'm in this little locker room. You show a, up in your sneakers. It was dude. a small PD. I had my sneakers on, right? Yeah. And so I'm like, but but they weren't black. And so I'm like, oh shit, what do I do? And up tucked in the corner of the locker room are these sweaty, filthy, disgusting boots that are two sizes too small. Squeeze your puppy. I walls. squeeze <laughs> into those things for the, the 12 hour shift and I didn't say a word about them. That's and good. I put them back up there and guess what? Well, Nobody never, ever knew until right now. And you've never forgot your boots. Well, I don't oh, know. Okay. That one. Yeah. <laughs> Not my first day. Oh, okay. That's funny. Yeah. So the, shit happens. Yeah. The FTO thing is just, uh, if you're, if you're out there and you're about to start FTO, I mean, I, I agree. I think the communication thing is pretty big and then, and then it's obviously safety, but like, look, I tell a lot of these young guys and some of them I see get off FTO and they're so afraid to go out there and like do stuff because they don't want to oh. make a mistake. And it's like, I, I encourage them. I'm like, go out. Like I, I'm your supervisor. I don't care if you go out, get waist deep into something. And you're like, dude, I don't know how to get myself out of this. Like I would much rather prefer that because then you have other guy, guys on the shift or even the sergeant to kind of like walk you through it. Mm -hmm. But ones that avoid it all the time because they're so afraid of that. I just, I don't see it working out for you long-term in this career. Like you might be that guy or, or gal that just kind of sits behind a black and white your Absolutely. whole career and, yeah. and don't go anywhere because mm -hmm. how are you ever going to learn? So but I was going to talk about that is, and I don't know your thoughts on FTO, but I, I got in the habit. I shouldn't say habit on occasion. I would talk to other trainees and I'd ask their FTO for permission first, because you can see a guy that might be struggling a little bit that needed, Hey, some other officer just talk to him and tell yeah. him, Hey, it's okay, dude. Because I think that's important too, is that the trainee gets some input from other guys, either mm -hmm. if you're doing good or you're doing bad, because that can really change. And I, I think that, you know, because they're going to be your partner one day. Yeah, you know, and that, absolutely. I mean, yeah. So it's, it's, and they do, they worry so much about screwing up. Yeah. They worry so much about, you know, if they're going to, you know, pass or fail or, you know, absolutely. impress anybody or ma yeah. you know, make a mistake. You're going to be that guy forever. So, um, and I, I've told lots of, you know, I wasn't an FTO, but you know, I, just wanted to, as a partner, a future partner, dude, it's okay. Like just be yeah, reliable. Nobody cares. Yeah. No, if you, if you, I mean, if you're not the FTO, you're the B partner. Um, I would say, you know, be courteous to your FTO that's on the shift and be like, Hey, can we, can me and you and your trainee have a talk? Um, or I've had <clears throat> trainees come up to me and say, Hey, ask a question or whatever. And I, I would give them my opinion, but I would always revert back to, but make sure that's the way your trainer, your FTO. Yeah, of course. Done. Um, but no, I think it's super important to encourage them to be successful. Obviously they're, they're running around the office, you know, like a chicken with their head cut off half the time. And as an FTO or prior FTO, it's important to rely on your partners to help kind of corral that. It, it takes, it takes a village, right? Yeah. It's the same concept yeah. in policing. It takes, it takes an entire patrol team to make sure that this person is going to, once they get cleared and push their own car, that they're going to be able to function appropriately. Especially because we can all yeah. see, I mean, we've seen that guy, oh, you know, God. that, isn't going to make it, but we've also seen the guy that's just like right on the cuff mm -hmm. and just needs a yeah. little bit of encouragement. 
So and that's that's what's nice. Yeah, I think you need the I think that you need the buy-in from the whole team. Yeah, exactly. The whole team is gonna make or break that person, you know. It's kind of funny because like we were talking about that, like talking about mistakes. And uh, you know, I so I was uh, my old department that I first started at, I think I was 22. I think I made the SWAT team. And uh again, yeah, I know it's funny, <laughs> right? But so there I am, and we're we're about to do this this SWAT op. And I think it was the very first SWAT operation I'd ever been on. And they're like, hey Kyle, you're gonna be the driver. And like you had to, this particular SWAT op, we were going to pick this dude off, uh, you know, wait for him to go to his car. He's going to go to work, whatever. And then we were going to like jump out boys and grab him. So we were driving this old piece of shit van that we had. And they're like, you're the driver. And we're going over the off and like, you have to park the van, you know, facing this direction and this parking stall, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, I'm fucking nervous. I'm like, oh it's my God, spinning. dude. <laughs> I'm like why me? Right. And so I'm like, all right, cool. I got it. And, uh, dude, I freaking, so we execute it. I roll up and I go to park the, the van and, and in my head, I'm thinking like, I'm, I think I was fucking thinking about it so much and trying so hard not to fuck it up. All I had to do is park the van. Dude, like Just, how hard is that? We do that every day. And I fucked it up. <laughs> I pull in, dude, I go to like turn the wheel and I freaking lay on the horn and Just I start little, honking the horn. Give a little heads up. <laughs> oh my dude. It was so, it was so bad. Like, they're, they're yelling at me and the fucking the team leader's like, what the fuck are you doing? And I'm like way stressed out at this point. I literally couldn't even park a van. <laughs> I fucked that up. So, um, but whatever, like I, I messed it up and, uh, yeah. dude, to this day, like guys laugh, they laugh at me Absolutely. about that. I mean, I, so. I think that, I think that's, you know, something encouraging to remind for these younger officers to remind. You're going to fuck shit up. Totally. You're going to royally. We, all three of us raise do. your hand if you haven't left your gun in the gun locker. You're, or you're, you're trunk and you have, drive away yeah, and you realize. So that, that speak l- a little tip to everyone out there: if you leave your gun someplace, leave your car keys. Because guess what? You can't leave without your car keys. That's so a good little you can't tip, leave yeah. without your gun. I've done that. And show yeah. up on a call and I'm all. Yeah. Oh or, shit! If I, my gun I mean, goes in the locker, my keys go in the locker. Yeah, we're not going to forget that. I'll never forget. Right after our, our incident, one of the we right back into it. Guy throws a gun on the roof, or he's p- holding the gun at his uh, his uh, family members. Both of us go get our rifles. Neither one of us had charged it, put a mag in, or anything. Did we just? Oh, you're talking about after we came back for being on admin leave? Yeah, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you brain fart sometimes. It happens, and you go, "Shit!" Luckily, you know, thank God. Yeah, yeah. It happens, man. But you know, you learn from it. You grow from it. Yeah. You maybe somewhere down the road get a laugh from it. Yeah, dude, it's a it, it, look, this is like as, as pissed off as all three of us get at this job and like, you know, you get stressed out and dude, this is like, it is the best job in the world. Absolutely. Like, y- you get a front seat road to like the craziest shit that goes on. And, and when everyone else is at privy to information, like you're there, man, like you, you have it. So it, it is such a fun job. Like you just got to learn to have fun with it, make mistakes. It's all good. Um, and like Nick said, it truly isn't for anybody. And if you're for in for everybody and if you're in the position and you're thinking like, yeah, this might not be for me, it, there is no harm or foul in walking away. I mean, I have friends that have done it. So yeah, and, who are very successful absolutely. to this day. Yeah. And so a lot of people don't know until you do it, you know, mm-hmm. and that's just you know, nature of the beast. Yeah. But so. And we, we've had, you know, I've had trainees and partners have had other FTOs have had trainees that were, didn't clear the program that we ran at our agency but we're able to get on with yeah, other, other departments yeah. Yeah. and be successful. Yeah. You know, sometimes um, trainees get in such, get into their head so bad that they're spiraling, spiraling, spiraling down the drain and they just can't stop it. Yeah. Um, they need like a reboot. They need a reboot. Yeah. Exactly. Great way. Well, the call volume that. might. Call volume. Might it could be, be the trainer. It could, you know, it could be a knee yeah. issue. It could be a, you know, a combination. Sometimes, you know, just finding a different agency, being able to hit the reset button um, and starting over is exactly what they need. They're still able to take the information yeah. and the knowledge yeah. that they gain from their time at FTO here or with me or with a partner, take it to another agency and be successful. So th- I think that's super important. That as long as you're not a huge officer safety liability, as long as you don't lie, steal, or do something stupid, um, there's always an opportunity to be successful. So, yeah, true. All right. Well, that, uh, Anything else on FTO? I mean, some of these young guys, um, it's just, we, we, we get a lot of messages for that. So I want to, and it, look, listen, we, I try, we try to get back to everybody guys on Instagram. Um, we get a lot of emails. Uh, if we don't get back to you right away, we, we are, you know, we're busy. We do work full time. And so, uh, we, we will get back to you. So, and on the, 
flip side of that is if you guys have questions or you want to reach out, reach out to us. If, if you have a question for somebody that's been on the show, you know, these guys or, or whatever, somebody else, like go through us. We can always get, get in touch with, um, with whoever. So, uh, don't be afraid to ask yeah. questions. We're, we're there for you guys. So, um, all right, moving on from that. So Nick, um, you have an interesting background. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> not to say, not to include you were a criminal as a juvenile, but, um, just, well, how did you what did you call it before? I had some youthful indiscretions. Yeah, that's right. Youthful yeah. indiscretions. They were bad enough to where like you couldn't be a cop. So yeah. couldn't no. have been that bad. Um, so you were a defense criminal investigator. Um, let's let's like talk about that because I feel like there's a lot of value on, in that on like the back end for cops to know like what are defense attorneys looking for? Like what mistakes maybe do cops make? Maybe it's a report writing thing um, that gives defense a, a loophole to, to let criminals out. I mean, what? <laughs> like, I guess yeah. tell everybody like, what did you do? Sure. Who was your dad? And how did you get started with that? And then how'd you transition from that? That was almost kindergarten cop. cop right there. Yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Who's your dad and what does he do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so he, I don't know. He asked a lot of questions. I'm know, trying sorry. to, let me, let me sort it out. Um, so I'll start off with, I, my dad was a, was a defense attorney and I grew up in the court house. I mean, since I was, I went to law school with my dad. I even have a little plaque they gave me because I would sit in the classroom with him and at, over at McGeorge, and this was 1980 I don't something. Know, seven. Yeah. yeah. And so, um, you know, we, poor college student really. And, and he found a niche that he liked in criminal defense. Um, and so I would also go to the courthouse with him on a regular basis. He didn't have a babysitter. So he dragged me around. Um, and that was our life. That was, I just grew up in the criminal, like we would have, you know, interaction with criminals, criminals at his office, you know, other attorneys that were in the criminal defense world. Um, and I wasn't sure that I wanted to be a lawyer. I kind of knew that I was too like rambunctious. I, I, I like being outside, you know? Um, and I, because of my youthful indiscretions, I, I also didn't like the police very much. <laughs> that wasn't really, uh, something I ever saw myself being initially. Um, and so from there, I was, oh, I'll do construction. You know, my family was pretty successful in construction. Realized real quick, I don't want to hammer nails into boards for the yeah, rest of my brutal. life. Brutal. Yeah, like dig trenches and like, nah, okay. I like to be outside, but not that kind of outside. <laughs> yeah. Like there's a Not the labor side. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so I kind of got hooked up with a, uh, a criminal defense investigator who my dad had worked with and he took me under his wing. Um, and that was oh, shoot, over 20 years ago now. And he, he, he was a former cop, South Bay cop. And he had this little business he was starting to do. And that was it. Um, started off doing subpoena work, you know, just serving papers and documents and then working into to bigger cases. Um, one of the best things that that did. So if you ever, if there's anybody here who is on the fence about being a cop, I would, I would implore you to maybe go do a summer as an investigator or, or assist in investigations, private doing civil or whatever, because it got me to talk to people. You know, we used to say that as a police officer, you know, we have the power of persuasion, right? You know, the power of authority, I mean, and as a defense investigator, you have to use the power of persuasion because I, I don't have any, like, I can't take you to jail. I can't tell you to sit on a curb. I can't, you know, like, I can't detain you as a criminal defense investigator. I have to I have to use my gift of gab and able to get you to do things that, um, or say things that I want you to say, you know, or to speak to me. Um, hand over your phone, you know, let me look at your email. Like, I have no power. I can't write a search warrant. I can do a subpoena maybe, but, um, you know, that'd be the attorney who does that. So that was how I started. I was 18 years old. 19, um, I was already working my assisting in my first homicide. Uh, that was alongside my dad. So I did a lot of work with my dad. He was, uh, I only worked for private attorneys. Um, and that also being around those people, you know, they're, they're intelligent people. They know the law. They know, um, you know, I worked for very respectable people. Um, or at least I respected, I'm sure some cops didn't respect them so much, but, um, you know, and, and I also learned there that, on our side initially, and I take it to being a cop now is it's not personal. Like I don't, I don't dislike cops, but you know, I didn't dislike cops as an investigator. I didn't look at them as the enemy. 
And a lot of times they looked at us as we were the enemy. You know, we've always yeah. joked, it's the dark side, you know, and we, you know, I go, you came from the dark side and maybe because yes, there are bad guys that probably and criminals that were released on technicalities or whatever it may be. Um, but it, it's a job. And, and one of the things that I gained from my dad is he was a true believer as they say, but it was the right to due process. Mm-hmm. And I use that in every interview that I've ever done to get a job, you know, at, um, uh, you know, working at your department and, you know, where I currently work is that I'm a firm de- believer in due process and that I don't want to be like the, you know, foreign countries over there that just lock people up and they don't see lawyers. And I want to be part of that process. So that's what I truly felt when I was young doing that defense work because, um, you know, I was part of the justice system. That was, mm-hmm. that was great. The downside was, is as you get older, you start having kids, you start, you know, your, your mindset changes. I was 20 and you move into being, you know, 25, 26, you're starting to raise a family and you're getting married and you realize, man, there is a lot of bad people out there and not a lot of them are being held accountable. So, um, did you learn that like through your work or did you learn that just in society? Like what you were seeing, like just on your everyday life with your family, people not being held accountable or, or were you seeing this firsthand doing that for a living? A both. Or both. Yes. Yeah. Both. I mean, definitely a lot on, on my side of the work, you know, there were, like you said, the technicalities, you know, I would do an investigation and it wouldn't be towards his innocence or guilt. It would be to find that, Hey, obviously not illegal or any, any type of lying, but it would be, Hey, how do we get out of this? You know, what's the, what's the way that the DA is going to drop this case? Oh, if you, you know, for instance, I'll, I'll say we find the CI. If you find the CI, a lot of times they'll want to dump that case because it's, it's a concern to the DA. So you go find the CI. Yeah. I mean, I've worked cases where I've worked with the CI and, you know, granted, we can't tell a CI, Hey, if, if your name comes out, we will drop the case. Um, because that may not necessarily be the truth because ultimately it's the DA that decides that, um, you know, but we have to tell the DA, you know, Hey, if this, if this CI name comes out or CI stands for who, if you may not know criminal informant, um, you know, if that information comes out, you know, we're not going to pursue this. We don't want to, because I would much rather drop a case than put a CI at risk or their family at risk or whatever it may be. Because if it's a big enough case, I mean, their life may be in danger. Their family's life yeah. may be in danger. Exactly. And, and, and that's where I felt like, well, wait a minute. Like, he's still a drug dealer. Like, well, yeah. I'm not changing that. You know, I initially, I got in it because, like I mentioned, the due process. And yeah. I want to, hey, if there's one innocent guy in prison, like, I, I want him out. Like, that's not okay to put, you know, an innocent person behind bars and restrict their freedom. Yeah. But at the same time, like, here we are not putting a legitimate drug dealer in jail because of we we found the guy who told on him, like, or helped the law enforcement. It just, yeah, I see it started saying. rubbing me the wrong way. The more and more, you know, we started yeah. doing that or, you know, some other ones that are a little more violent. You know, you, you get the guy who beats his wife and you say, look, don't beat your wife anymore, man. Like you can't do that. And, and ma'am, I, he's not going to do that. You, you get your, you know, we always make sure they have an attorney so that she's protected in case she, you know, she lies or she wants to not, you know, testify. And then he goes and, you know, beats her into a coma or, or I've had mm-hmm. him beat him to death. You're like, Holy smokes, dude. Like that's the guy that, but you told him not to do it. Well, and I assured <laughs> her that, Hey, we've talked yeah. to him. Don't worry. It, you know, and it, and it weighs on you, you know, and you start doing that more and you're starting to see the, the greater effect. You go to these homes of, you know, kids that are abused and you're like, and I mean, physically or neglect or whatever. And it's like, my God, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, I'm not remedying the situation. Mm-hmm. All I'm doing is just yeah. helping this individual. So, um, you know, the parent, you know, try to get back their kid. It, it was, it was hard. And, and as I, like I said, I got older and then my dad got sick. Um, so my rock in the due process foundation, the purpose behind why I wanted to defend the rights of, you know, in the defense world, um, he, he passed, he got sick and then he ultimately died. Um, and I, I just kind of realized, I think I could serve a greater purpose. I still could be in law enforcement. I can still be part of the justice system. So, you know, I figured why not? I thought I would make an okay cop. You know, I'm not, you know, I'm not, you were okay. I'm not bad. All right, dude. 
Yeah. I mean, <laughs> you, you made it. You, you guys, you guys hang out with me every now and then. Yeah. So, so, um, so kind of spin off on that. So did you find that the same process was the, or the same reason on the, I guess you could say the offensive side of things, the same reason. I mean, I have found as an, as a, I'll say investigator, you know, a year on you have many more years than I do, but the same method, you're not looking to find everybody guilty. You're just looking for the truth. No, and that's we we are fact finders, the, and that's um, one of the things that my original boss told me, the guy that hired me when I was eighteen. And I use the quote; and I use it all the time. Hey, you tell me A, I write A. You tell me B, I write B. I'm not going to write C, D, E, and F. You know, I'm not going to. That's not what we're here to do. Yeah. Um. You know, obviously, you're defense minded when you're doing interviews. If you're for the defense, and a lot of times, what, what cops don't understand is that we use that for leverage a lot. You know, we were using it, you know, Johnny tells me, hey, man, I got a witness. She'll tell you that I did not shoot that guy. And you go interview the witness and she says, no, Johnny shot him in the face. Like I saw him. <laughs> you go back to Johnny. Look, man, your one witness says that you did it. Like you need to take this deal like or you're going to prison for the rest of your life or whatever. Maybe, you know, a lot of times you use as leverage. Um, and you also again, you're just you're another cog in the wheel of justice that they deserve an investigator and you're out there doing the job. So, um, but that's, a, that's the one thing I think that's always bothered me with cops when I was working as a defense. And that's what helped me as a, as a uh, detective or even a cop early on, but as a detective is I'm a fact finder. I'm just, I'm here to find the truth. Mm -hmm. Probably right. There's always the truth. There's what they're saying. And there's something in the middle and I'm trying to get as close to the truth as I can because no one's ever rarely is anybody a hundred percent honest. Um, you know, so that's, that's how I approach being a detective. I, I always found it interesting. And, you know, I, I've been to court where like the defense attorney will come out in the waiting room or whatever and be like, my client's a fucking idiot, you know, like, <laughs> or he's a shit bag, you know, like they know it. And so I, I've always been kind of torn on like, I get what you're saying. You're, you're, um, you're there to, to be a fact finder and people that don't deserve to be in prison should not be locked up. I, Obviously, I hope all of us agree on that. But where I get hung up is like, you know, someone's guilty. Like the evidence, the evidence is there to show that someone's guilty, yeah. right? Especially yeah. when you talk about like sexual assault cases, rape, you know, child stuff, uh, murder. And then you've got like a defense attorney who deep down knows that. But then they're looking for some bullshit loophole that a cop did to get that person off of what they did. And then you got to you got to think like, well, they're obviously doing it for the money. Like. Well, I mean, yes and no. I That's mean, where I have a problem. I think so. There's a lot of defense attorneys out there. There's a lot of uh, defense investigators out there. And I think um, they're not all the same, just like not cops mm -hmm. are the same. Yeah. Right? There's there's bad seeds in all of them. There's shady people in all of them looking for the, the quick buck or, or big buck. Um, so, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I haven't had that experience where like on a sex case, I, I'll be honest with you. I didn't work a lot of those. The attorneys I worked for were mainly homicides, you know, dope cases, um, some robberies, assaults, things like that. Like, because you got to realize too, if you're hiring a defense attorney, that alone is not cheap. And now you're adding, hiring a, an investigator, a, an investigator on, top of, on yeah. top of that, a private investigator. Yeah, he's got to get paid. Yeah. So it's not cheap. Um, you know, I think one is it's to keep people in, in check, right? Because if you don't have checks and balances, the cops got to make sure they do their job. Yeah, for sure. And, and if you just, if you don't call them on the technicalities, part of that is then they'll just keep doing that mistake. And then maybe it will get that innocent person caught up that shouldn't have been caught up. Um, I, I think that's how they've always looked at it. A, a lot, sometimes I can't vouch for them all. There are a yeah. lot of guys like, you know, that believe, you know, unfortunately all cops are liars. And I, that's yeah. obviously, that's not true. Like I, I, that's, that's so far from the truth. Um, but just like a lot of cops think all defense attorneys are scumbags. Yeah. That's also not the truth. Yeah. Um, I, I make it a point whenever I'm sitting in the hallways at the court to try to talk to a defense attorney and just, I talked to one that was handled DUI stuff and I kind of asked him and we were both open dialogue, open books about everything from investigations on my side to where he tends to quote unquote attack, uh, DUI investigations. And, uh, you know, I, I've always had respect for them. I think that, like you said, it's, it's, it is a part, it is a portion that is in the due process, which is very important because if one of us is accused, accused of a crime, 
I want the best of attorney. Yeah. I want yeah. them to go after that loophole yeah. to find a reason. Um, but I, it is, it is very important. I think it's a mutual respect and you know, the dark side, there's a dark side to every single portion of, of there's yeah. a dark side law enforcement and the medical field and, you know, in the lawyer in, in law realm. Um, so speaking of talking to defense attorneys, I will, I highly suggest that everybody, if you're in law enforcement, if you have a trial, reach out to the cop. Don't talk about your case or obviously during the case, but once it's done, if it's adjudicated or you, you know that the attorney's no longer working it, there's no harm in asking, Hey, how was I? I mean, people, the cops yeah. would come to my dad on a regular and say, so how'd I do? Like testifying. Yeah. Yeah. How, how'd I do? Cause yeah. Right. The, he's the oh man. You were pretty shaky up there. Oh, hey, good job. You know, I appreciate it. And, and my dad had a real like mutual respect for the cops. Um, and I think they had a respect for him because he did fight for his client. But he also he wasn't, you know, shady, shady. And he's like digging up, you know, divorce papers. And I mean, you'd be surprised. There are some that will do that stuff. Yeah. But I, it, go talk to a defense attorney. Um, in the hallway, right? Go BS with them and, and find out, Absolutely. Hey, what could I have done better? You know, or what, Hey, how, what do you think about this? Um, it's not gonna, it's not a us versus them. They're not gonna, some might, there might be, you know, a few public defenders, especially, and I don't mean to bag on them if they're ever listening. So I apologize in advance, but, um, I think one is they're overwhelmed and they do, you know, they're well, they a take lot more so newer cases, yeah, yeah. and they're a lot newer and they just don't want to yeah. talk to you and deal with you. Um, but I mean, we go to some classes where defense attorneys come mm -hmm. in and I will say that's some of the best teaching that we're going to get is from a defense. Like that's why I, I loved what I did before. Cause it made me that much better of a detective. Absolutely. You're, I mean, you're yeah. being taught what to do and how to do it by the person evaluating it or yeah. by the other team. It. Yeah. Right. It'd be like a baseball pitcher telling you, Hey, I'm going to throw you this right now. Yeah. yeah. And you're like, Holy smokes. I know how to hit that pitch. Yeah, I talked to some pretty up. pretty cool, uh, pretty cool defense attorneys in court. You know, Absolutely, the ones that will come talk talk to you. And like you said, man, I've had some that flat out will call you a liar, like to your face. And yeah, you're like, okay, whatever. Yeah, and you're never gonna win those people over, nah. so don't don't bother. But yeah. you'd be surprised. I think a lot. There's more that will than that won't. And uh, it, it's it was a great job. You know, we talked about the kids who have a hard time talking to people and the social skills. Yeah, and I, I mentioned it earlier, like maybe you can't go be an investigator for a side job, but go do a job where you have to go talk to people of all walks of life. I mean, that was, I could talk to, you know, the business owner running a, a million dollar company. And then I'd have to go talk to like a homeless guy who doesn't have two nickels to rub together mm -hmm. and be able to <laughs> obtain good work product from both of them. Um, I think we're actually supposed to call them unhoused now. Well, back then <laughs> when I was just houseless, homeless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, no. back absolutely. then they were still homeless. Now yeah, it's they like, still unhoused. are. No, no, they're unhoused. <laughs> yeah, it's unhoused. So, sorry, but but are your gangsters, are your murderers? You know, like they, you had to learn to talk to these people, and you yeah. had to learn to talk to their families, and you had to, you know, I, my wife hated it because I was like a chameleon. You know, I don't think she ever knew for a long time to like, do I trust you? Like, who who are yeah. you sometimes? <laughs> um, and that's that's it because you had to go hey, talk to a totally Hispanic family. And then go talk to a totally African-American family and the cultures couldn't, you know, they're totally different, but you yeah, have to so. be able to communicate and fit in and then go off and talk to, you know, uh, an Asian family who has totally different cultures. And, yeah. Yeah. Know, and it's, it's Culture's huge culture. Yes. And even having that, I remember when I was on patrol, I responded out to a house party and it was a rager. It was massive. And it was, um, I don't know, they were Islanders. So they, these dudes were massive. Yeah. And they, they were like around, six, yeah. six, <laughs> 300 pounds. They were huge, but I know how much respect they have for the females in their family. Yeah. yeah, the so, and the yeah so I asked to speak to the mom yep. and the mom came to the door surrounded, Dude, I think by, I these, was on that with surrounded by these giant, I'm talking, I mean, they were towering over yeah. me. If they wanted, they could pound me into the ground. Thank God they didn't. And I was very respectful to her and very courteous, but coming down to the culture and knowing kind of how to address that and how to communicate. And, um, you know, they shut the party down. It was for graduation. Everyone was having a good time. They invited me in for food. Um, you know, so it's just about, about I, I was on that call with you. That was on the side street of, uh, oh man. Yeah, we won't remember. say where. It was yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. We were, we were probably all, I, all I do remember that. Shift, yeah, yeah. I don't remember yeah. you guys at the door. It was, it was, me, it was so a thanks. lot. It was a lot. <laughs> if, mom, if mom or grandma says to shut it down, those boys. Yeah, are absolutely. Shut it down, dude. So yeah. no, and that, but that's, that type of, um, uh, experience is invaluable. And I don't think kids are getting that going, you know, making it full circle, getting back to all the, yeah. the young kids. I mean, 
I was blessed to be able to be thrusted in that experience. And thankfully it, it worked out. Okay. You know, I, I had a good time there. Um, it did start waning on me as I got older, but, um, I was able to thankfully to transition into being uh, a police officer, which, you know, career wise has been the best thing. So, um, I'm very thankful for that as well. You never thought about going back. It, that is, I think, harder transition. To yeah. be honest, I think once you see, I can see that it is. I, I mean, a lot of so. cops do it, and actually, yeah. I think more yeah. probably do it that way than the other way. But for me, knowing I was on one side and now on the other, I don't the transition back. I could probably do one of the things I did a lot was work in the prisons, and I think I could do that because it's. I mean. The, the victims are other prisoners, you know, the cases inside, everything's in the prison that, you know, it's, it, I don't think it affects, you know, the outside society as much. Maybe I'm just telling myself that that's what I could do, but I it's pretty confined space. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like it's not, yeah, I don't, I'm not worried yeah. about mom and pop or grandma getting, yeah. you know, ever being assaulted or kids getting assaulted. Like it's, it's, this is what's going on. Cause that was one of the big things I did in the prison was, you know, interview those inmates and, and do investigations within the prisons. Um, and again, just more experience that, that worked out really well. Can you think it, was there like, is there a case in particular that you worked on with your dad? That was like a pretty, pretty high, high profile case, like a homicide or. Oh yeah. It was probably one of my, well, so we, I mean, we had a couple, um, you know, one was one of the very first ones that it already been worked on by some other attorneys and he was now appointed to it. And, it was a fairly um, uh, prominent homicide in the the city I live in, so you know a young girl, and that that made it that much worse. And it was by another young boy uh, who was pretty well known. And you know, our our town's not that big that we live in, and uh, that was great because I kind of got this. I got to sit back and you know, my dad was an investigator in a sense. He did a lot of the investigation. He would go through all the the photo. So I learned like the playbook of how to investigate a case from that homicide, watching him, you know, diagram the house, you know, doing his own diagrams, even though the cops did it, you know, the investigators and the detectives, you know, contacting witnesses. It, I, I was more like his shadow, I guess he was like my FTO and it was on a homicide, which is, and it was, you know, the most gnarly crime that you could think of. And um, and it was just tragic. It was, it was horrible. I, you feel horrible for the family. And that was another thing that he was able to help navigate how to deal with victims, families. Cause as you know, you know, I think you're, you're working one now mm -hmm. dealing with the families is just as difficult. And you know, you have to have compassion and you have to have some empathy, but at the same time you have to work a case. So learning how to do that early was, was incredibly helpful. Um, so would your dad like get involved with the victim's family as well? <clears throat> How'd that work? Out? I mean, well, one is they're there every day and they, they want to hate my dad. Yeah. You know, they want to hate the attorney. So, but sometimes you need to interview him like, Hey, mm -hmm. your cousin might have been at the house. Well, how do we interview him? How do we, how do you win over? And I don't even want to say win over, but how do you make it, um, comfortable enough to where I can talk to you and talk about this case to a family member. And that's, he was extremely good at, he, that's where, I mean, I don't know if I have the gift of gab, but he definitely did. He, he could talk, um, anybody, he could just talk to anybody about anything and they felt comfortable and he wasn't afraid to do it. So, um, it is hard. That's, that's a very tricky one, you know, um, seeing how the, the victim's families, um, and you know, too, to say, you know, I'm not, I might not approach mom, you know, cause she's never going to talk to you. But, yeah. Um, it is, it makes it is difficult. Yeah. Yeah. I, I can only imagine that'd be super difficult. Um, but yeah, there's others. I mean, it, that's in every time I learned from him, you know, from my dad, from the, everything that he did, cause he'd been doing it. See, by then, see, 80, so, so 15 years at that point. Um, and then we worked together for about 10 years. So I think he was doing this for 25, almost 30 years. Wow. Yeah. Long time. <clears throat> yeah. And, and it was, you just keep learning, you know, how he would, like I said, interview people, approach people, you know when to be confrontational, know when to call people out on their, their shit, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, know when to kind of rein it back. Um, I'm still working on that part, but. <laughs> Very confrontational. Right? Yeah. And learning yeah. how to rein it back. Yeah. yeah. I would agree. But no, it's, it, um, that was my best teacher. I mean, I, I was, I was blessed to be able to have that and watch and learn, um, you know, and I've had, 
you know, learning from Kyle, you know, learning from you guys. Absolutely. It's, it's this whole business is about learning. Yeah. You will never, ever know everything. No, ever. Like, <laughs> like even in the niche that you're in, like being a detective or whatever it is that you're doing, like you're never going to know it all. all no. Constant learning. Yeah. This job is so it, hard. It's always evolving. Yeah, you know, it, there's it always new case law yeah. coming out. There's new techniques. There's new technology. Yeah. There's different approaches. Yeah. Um, there's always something that, that you can learn from. I mean, you know, 10 years on and I'm 11 years on, I'm still learning stuff to this day. Oh, totally. and I'm like, dude, I had no clue about that. Totally. Um, yeah. Just, I think that's one of the cool things about this job though, is like the constant evolution of like, it's constantly changing. It's learning new laws. It's just something always new. Well, that's why I, I didn't want to nail a, you know, nail boards together because that's the same yeah. thing. You're yeah. nailing a board, you're digging a trench, yeah. you know, it's, this is, it was, it was a new case. It was just, it's a lot of fun. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm blessed. I, I probably have, you know, 10 more years to go. I don't know where that will take me, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there's portions that seem redundant, but when you, when you step back and look at them, that they're very different, whether it's calls for service or whether it's investigations, um, you know, that there's certain aspects that are similar, but then yeah. there's also ones that are, there's, there's different angles, there's different approaches, there's different victims responses or different suspect responses. So th there's always a difference with every individual case, which I love. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you think know. about it. You go to work every day. You literally don't know what's going to get thrown at you. That you don't. Day. You have <laughs> you no don't. idea. You cannot predict the future. So, I mean, and the day that you think you do, guess what? Oh, yeah. Sure. 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 Um, yeah, it, I don't really know what else to say about that, to be honest with you. It's cool, man. It's unique. Like, I don't think you see a lot of guys in this job that come from your background. <clears throat> At least I don't think I've ever met any. No, I, I think it is. And it is hard. There are some, you know, you, you don't know when to tell people because, <laughs> you know, hey, what you know, what agency did you come from? And they're like, eh, I came from this agency. Yeah, we're, we're anywhere else. You're like, yeah, I did. <laughs> yeah, technically. The dark side. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, um, I usually try to also throw in like the little bit of fugitive recovery, you know, bail bond stuff to make it sound cooler, but <laughs> it doesn't really help. Then it just, you just sound even. So I did that as well because I was, yeah. believe it or not, this was like a track star at one point. Yeah. yeah. And so I was, remember. Yeah. You remember? Nah, I'm just kidding. <laughs> right into a tree. I remember. Uh, that was not, yeah. I, that was the ground or something. Yeah. It caught me in the, on my head. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what that was. <laughs> but uh, anyhow, yes. Camera can probably catch it. Seven staples in my head. Yeah, we'll edit it out. Oh, that's right. I forgot about that. Yeah. No, Why don't you share that story, dude? Uh, okay. Yeah, well, I was with an, um, uh day after Christmas, uh, December 26th, uh, 2017. Yes, because I, would, I was ready to go into detectives. I was just kind of waiting, I think. I remember right. Um, anyhow, call comes out suspicious activity at a house uh, an officer gets there initially code four is it or you know says he'll advise and then he realizes something's kind of goofy and, and i could tell i knew that house was a little bit suspect so i start heading that way anyway um i roll up and i see a guy that looks pretty suspect like i think he had some tattoos on his neck you know he, he looks a little you profiled him you're judging criminal <laughs> criminal profiling is okay based yeah. on my training experience. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so anyhow, yeah, I hop out and start assisting and I'm kind of doing like a, a perimeter. He's, you know, we're on the front yard of this house. I keep hitting this. Is that going to be, a no, problem? It's all good. no okay. you're good, dude. Um, I'm a hand guy sometimes. Nope, so. Totally good. Um, so anyhow, we, uh, run these people out. They're playing the name game. So he, Right away, we know something's goofy uh, with the male half. It was a male and female. Immediately, though, and it's a seasoned officer, and he's apologized a million times to me for this story and the way he did it. But the male half starts doubling over, and he says he's got diarrhea from bad Taco Bell. It happens. It does, but um, it was just weird how it came on the minute we started figuring out who his name was. And ended up, comes back, he's a pal. Um, Which is what? Tell everybody what a pal is. So. Yeah, it's a prole at large. There so he... He hadn't checked in. I'm glad I remember that. I don't deal with those people. Yeah. <laughs> They're scary. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but anyway, um, rather than, you know, I think you, you would maybe triangulate to where one guy is behind him and another guy's in front of him and then say, Hey, put your hands behind your back. My partner walks over and says, Hey, put your hands behind your back while we're both 
on the other side of him. You know, He's all, him. nope. Yeah, that's, uh, that's exactly what happens. We're running down. I will. Oh, we're hold not. on, time out. I got a cramp, dude. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> okay. I did legs today at the gym, boy, and I'm, I just cramped up. You gotta eat your bananas, dude. Oh. I'm gonna send the monkeys. That's cramp. gonna make the bloopers. Oh, boy. Monkeys never cramp. Oh. Why? <laughs> Three bananas. <laughs> monkeys eat bananas. Okay. Oh, sorry about that. I had to stretch that one out. Oh, That's man. a Japanese baseball player. Okay. Yeah. My bad. Should it's going to make the bloopers. I can leave that in. Yeah, just, no, made, I just made the oh. bloopers. Yeah. All right. So sorry, dude. So go ahead. <laughs> um, so he goes to tell him, put your hands behind your back. Uh, we're standing on the wrong side of him. And that's when the guy said, I'm a pal and I'm out of <laughs> here. See you later. The, the chase is on. Uh, my partner was a little bit older and I still like to run after people. So I chase him. And I don't know, it's probably midnight um, and I'm running down the street and I don't know, certain parts in our city, um, it just turns into woods for no reason. Like you could be in the most, you know, urban area and then boom, you're in like the, the wooded, most wooded area <laughs> yeah, ever. Like a little green belt or something. Yeah, I'm like, what? This is the, it, our city has always been weird like that. I mean, you could drive down and see cows in, in the front yard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The city makes no sense. So anyhow, uh, he darts off into the woods and like a fool, I chase him. Uh, I dive after him. We're kind of rolling in the ground, uh, in the woods, and I'm hanging on to him. But he's trying to roll away, and he rolls into a like a cement ravine that it carries like it's like a water. I don't know what the heck it is. Like a it's it's a creek. It's a creek, but it's cemented. It's a creek. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's cemented. It's, it's just a controlled area of the creek. <laughs> okay, well, we're fancy. It's we're fancy. Yeah, it's, yeah. So there's, that's it's not surprising creek. anything. Yeah. yeah. So he rolls down the creek. And uh, I, that's where I called it. Okay, I'm not doing that. I run back and uh, I'm following. I'm actually like paralleling because I can see him run. And that, by then the air started getting there and, and K9 showed up and the air was great. They directed him. I mean, they gave him every warning, you know, hey man, like we see you here jumping mm-hmm. over the fence now. It was great air. Um, and then the dog got on him. But I go back uh, to where my partner is with the female half and she's now in the backseat. She's crying a little bit. And, uh, I, all of a sudden, you know, I feel like some wetness on my head and, and my partner's like, holy smokes, dude, like you're dripping. Blood. I just had blood coming all down my head. <laughs> you know, you're sweaty and it was hot out. I yeah. You know, Adrenaline. Yeah. And you yeah, don't feel absolutely. it. Yeah. Um, I mean, so even then I didn't think it was really that bad. Um, so he's telling this girl, you know, Hey, my partner's really hurt. You better give up the boy. Like, you know, where's he going? Where's he live? He didn't know at the time he'd already been caught. Um, and so, you know, he, he, what if he dies? Like, you're going to be held accountable for this. It was pretty, <laughs> you're all, whoa, how bad is it? <laughs> I'm like, well, do you see something? I don't like, yeah. So anyway, I was, the, the best part about it was, is I was told to drive myself to the hospital. That's nice. What? Yes. Oh my God. So obviously like, I wasn't sure what was going to happen. So I'm calling my wife. Uh, and did like, you end up driving yourself to the hospital? Yeah. I drove all the way to Roseville. We won't talk about that. Super so I drove to Roseville yeah. and uh, <laughs> there I come in there and I'm just like blood. I mean, I don't know if you see my tack vest, but at the time it's just it, the whole side is covered in, in dried blood uh, because of this. And so uh, they immediately go like, holy smokes. And they, they put me in a room, treated me really nice. Uh, shout out to uh, Roseville Sutter, I believe. Sutter, Sutter, Roseville, Sutter yeah. Roseville. Yeah. Great people. there. From, uh, Mark Thank actually you. works for them now. Well, host. No, that's great. I think you're supposed to give me a job there, actually. Yeah, yeah that's, okay. that's true. Yeah, Anyways, that's, that's hurtful. How many white claws do you think he's in right now? Oh, Nick? No. No. Oh, Mark, Mark in Nashville? Oh, yeah. Definitely. He's a white claw drinker, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, definitely a white claw drinker and probably oh. three and he's drunk. Yeah. He was already, yeah, drunk. Yeah. Good for him. Yeah. Well, I mean, it is what, like 10 o'clock over there? Yeah. 11? I mean, that's acceptable. Good for you, Mark. Yeah, no yeah. laws, it, it, no laws you, when you're drinking claws. If you end up actually watching your own show <laughs> that you're not on right now, <laughs> good for you, man. Yeah, and shout out to Sutter again. Shout out to Mark. Thank you. Uh, they took great care of me. And so uh, st- they stapled my head. And I will say they did such a good job. I mean, I'll never have as nice hair as, as, as Kyle. But thank you. they told me that if they do, don't, like, part it, they just throw staples in. Your hair is, like, forever, like, yeah. runs a, a crooked Jagging line. Shit, yeah. Yeah. So they, they did. They parted it really nice. And then they put, like, I don't know. Somewhere. Probably because you're a cop. They went a little. They went at the extra mile, yeah. dude. So after I got seven staples in my head, and by the way, my wife was just like you, like super furious, like, wait, you're driving yourself? Yeah. You're bleeding? I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I've never yeah, had that, like. That doesn't make sense. Yeah, that, that's kind of odd. So but it gets better. We lost a person that night. Um, unfortunately. The air had him though, I thought. Huh? 
What do you I mean? You no, captured. no, we, we lost uh, another officer that night. Um, but I get back and uh, they said, hey, do you think you can finish your shift out? <laughs> That's Seriously? Dead serious. Dude, I didn't I, know any of this. Yeah, I finished. And you my, did, huh? I did. I mean, little bitch. fucking <laughs> nice, dude. Yeah. That's I, I savage. Uh, I did not like taking time off. I didn't want to be one of those guys. I mean, I, that's one of the things I prided myself on was being, and this goes back to having the conversations with FTOs. I said, look, dude, no one's got to like you. No one's got to like think you're the coolest guy. I yeah. said, here's what the, you got to do. Know that everyone can expect you to be the first one through the door. If you're going to be the first one through the door, that's all that matters. And that's kind of was my mentality on patrol. Like, and I actually followed it probably a lot after Kyle. I mean, not to make your ego any bigger, <laughs> but... <laughs> I'm not sure he's going to be able to walk out of here after we're done, (laughs) but Kyle was a great like mentor for me coming on patrol and seeing how he, like, again, everyone knew he'd be the first one through the door. That's how I wanted to be. And that's how I wanted people to be like, Hey, old one's going to do whatever. And I was now looking back, I could have gotten all kinds of crazy. (laughs) (laughs) Wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah. I got seven staples in my head and I'm still working here. Yeah. So, but you wouldn't be able to tell this story right now if you, no, it wouldn't have sounded nearly as cool. If you just stopped chasing and set a perimeter, it it wouldn't be as cool. So what, what, like what caused your head to split open? I either think it was, he thinks a tree. I don't remember any trees, but I could have swore you hit a tree. I thought that was what I said. I think it was like, it's a green belt. There's trees everywhere. It's It's a green belt. It's it's like woods. There's no. I don't know what a green belt. Green belt is, like ch- a wooded area is a green belt. Like, it's like a wooded area within the city. Yeah. So it's like a little green belt. I area. call it the woods. So forgive me. Well, yeah. whatever. Yeah. That's because you're. Well, a city that's boy. because you're not from anywhere where trees are. Yeah. I, mean, I live in the mountains up there. Not mountains. Those are mountains. Hey, did yeah. it? Did it hurt? <laughs> Those are hills. Out, did it hurt getting the staples? Or I mean, obviously they numb it and stuff. But I mean, no, they just went for Dude, it. Dude, I've seen no at MSJ. The, 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 when they do it. Yeah. I've seen uh, some hardcore. hospitals. Like I've had some dog bites that were, were in the head and, and dude, there was no love from the nurse. It was just like, no, boom, boom, boom. No anesthesia, yeah. nothing. Just, it was just well, like, boom, boom. I think it comes down to the injury itself. Like, right. Cause they got to contain it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, you know, if it's bad, dude, they got to just, they got to just uh, close it I've out. I've seen them sitting like just in the hallway and they walk over and just like, yeah, stable, I have stable, too. Stable, I'm like, stable, holy stable. shit. Like no yeah. numbing, nothing. Just well, I think boom. it comes down to, are they going to get paid for that by the insurance company? Yeah, like, <laughs> How far, well, and then I, know, I thought they would have given you that, but they may, I, I be honest, I don't remember. I think I was more just like in days. And then you were like, go went back to work. That's yeah, crazy. Well, and I, they handed uh-huh. me a bill. Like, I'm like, wait, what? I felt like something was supposed to be done. Cause I'm, yeah. you know, it was a work injury. They did. They gave me, they're like, Hey, by the way, it's gonna be like a hundred. I'm still, I, look, look, dude, it's supposed like to be different. somebody dropped the ball that night. And, uh, and maybe, were, maybe it was because of that other they were situation. Dealing with that a lot, I think. And it was just not to mention like, yeah, there was just a busy night, you know, which is weird. It was day after Christmas. But yeah, they were definitely dealing with a whole lot. <laughs> yeah. So that's crazy. That is that's that and you know, or my last day of of patrol ever. That was another my crazy last day life. of patrol ever. I think I've worked maybe one or two days of, of patrol after that, um, after becoming a detective, and it was with this guy, and. This is when doing the right thing goes wrong. So we're trying to do the <laughs> right thing. Way to put it. Yeah. You know, you, you, you go out and you see a guy that clearly has probably had one too many drinks, but maybe he could just make it home if you just give him a ride. And then next thing you know, he's tased. Yeah. <laughs> and, and first he's fighting you and now he's tased on the ground. Well, it was, it was like one of those, it was a civil standby. Oh. Is what it was. It was a civil standby. Oh, one of those. It, that ninety nine percent of the time, municipal police officers are going to say, "Hey, this is a civil matter. It's not a police matter, right?" But as Nick said, we try to do the right thing. We get a hold of baby mama who comes out to try to drop some stuff off. This was a guy that once again was giant. He was like six he eight. Had to be six six two yeah. two eighty three hundred pounds. Just a big dude that was had way too many beers, and uh, yeah, I went sideways. <laughs> he threw a big like this big uh, haymaker this, also it was the slowest, slowest punch in the world yeah but he was big dude right yeah and you're trying to like that's he, a lot of lumber that's a big bat swing like, the car so we had to yank him off the car and it was yeah yeah and then we tased him and that was a big fall because yeah. yeah. as well, you said I it was, he was yeah. big luckily he through the through the lockup he tucked his chin and so his head didn't hit the ground thank god because you know, that, that's not what we want to do. Yeah, obviously. no, it would have ended up in so, issues getting staples. Um, ultimately, it was a big, <laughs> giant misdemeanor um, that I don't even, I don't remember going to court for. So it I'm was sure probably, they, it they was probably dropped. 647 <laughs> yeah, and yeah. walked it off. It was probably I mean, dropped. I don't even know if we charged them for 148. Yeah. 
But yeah, yeah that's that was my last day of patrol. Yeah, and I'll never forget that. As that's my last call too, because we didn't even have to transport. I just went back to the PD. Yeah, it, that, but that was another night where a bunch of shit was hitting the found elsewhere. Yeah. The sergeant was dealing with another incident, and yeah, like, I don't even think he came out because no, we he didn't. Had, we just had to swoop him and go. Like, just, dude, that's the fun part of the job, right? Like, absolutely. Well, I, you know, fun, intense. I mean, they can kind of go it's hand all, in hand. It's a little bit of everything. I, it's, yeah, we, I mean, we had some good times. That's, I, I, you know, obviously I'm sure that you're the audience and, or listeners, I don't know what are they are. Audience um, or listeners? I think Fans? it depends. So if you're on YouTube, they're, I, I would say they're viewers. viewers? Okay. Yeah. If they're listening on audio, they're listeners. Yeah. So the viewers can probably tell I'm, I no longer work with, with you guys anymore. And, and he's with another agency doing yeah. bigger and better things. Uh, yeah. It, it's a great, we'll leave it great at job. That. Um, but I, uh, I had some of the best times with, with you guys and totally. I working patrol, um, in this city was a lot of fun. Totally. So, you know, the, the arson investigator that, uh, got into the fist of cuffs at the, Oh yeah. That made a Honda there. Yeah. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Was that you that was chasing that guy with me? Cause he, yes, he, he had the big like jacket where he flapped it and we, yeah, we're so like, Ugh. I don't know, maybe he listens to, to this I, I don't know but uh yeah that guy was a arson investigator um who i i mean have police powers to yeah, he's a, he's yeah. A deputy i think yeah they're, so, they're sworn but but he took it but, but he like but he took it to a whole nother level yeah like this he dude, was great he'd go out and find criminals but oh, if I remember that's not correctly, typical like, yeah this dude drove around in like a old green ford explorer like not marked obviously or anything and like i remember one night um we're working and we get we get dispatched to him being in pursuit of a stolen car and Go, I'm going backwards. Remember the dude is going backwards, <laughs> like track. driving backwards on like oncoming traffic in this arson. Like reverse backwards. Yeah, yeah, like reverse backwards. backwards. And like whips the car around. We show up, he foot bails and we're like chasing this guy. And uh, dude, it was so, it so was I, I, it may big. be different in every area, but in our area, arson investigators are hose draggers, firemen, no, I don't. I don't think they are. No, they are. They are firemen. I went to the academy all, with one. No, I don't think all of them are. I went to the academy with one. He was a fireman, and in order to become an arson investigator, oh. he had to get he had to get He'll his get peace post, powers. Post he had to get post certified, okay. right? Yeah. Um, post stands for Police Officer Standardized Testing in California. Um, that's where, a, where that's an right there. So he had oh he had gosh. to get certified. So <laughs> most of them are full on like you know sleeping at nighttime, polishing crow and making chili, doing what they do. But it sounds like this guy was totally different. He was a squirrel. He, he yeah. yeah, he, he, liked he really to wanted to be a cop. There was a, yeah. there was oh, a couple totally times where we, totally. we would go out. He put on the radio, you know, hey, I got a 10 8 or I'm, you know, scrapping yeah. with one. He's like ch- getting in pursuits, yeah. dude, as a, it yeah. was crazy. It was fun. We need to recruit him. We need more cops. I want to say, uh, that. I think he's probably doing okay. In that I want to say we like tase that guy, turn into like just, we did because <laughs> we and I was like, I was like, dude, how what did are this you happen? doing? <laughs> exactly. yeah, like, how did we end up here? <laughs> Those are the best I think calls. Our boss was like, how did this happen? You're like, so he was driving backwards against traffic and this guy in the Ford Explorer was chasing him. Yeah. Then the it, wrong way down. Yeah. yeah. The best calls are when, when everything's settled, the dirt, the I'm dust gonna, is settled and you go, holy shit. How did we get here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can totally. I'm going to laugh if he, li- if he actually like watches it, he might. Cause I mean, a lot of local guys, I, I thought he was great. I, I don't know how he is in a, as an arson investigator, but he still is. He's still an arson investigator. Oh, cool. I just, yeah, we just, uh, I you should to plug him with some of the rest vast, dude. Tell him, mess, oh, tell dude, him message you. I enjoyed it. Cause I think he put, I think he made a couple, um, calls for service that, that made it enjoyable. Questionable. For the night. Well, I don't want to say questionable. Or enjoyable. Enjoyable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Good times. It good was times. good times. There's, there's a lot. I mean, some foot pursuits chasing. You ever heard the, where I'm running north, east, south. I, I don't know where. This one's? Yeah, I've heard oh, that yeah, one. Me. I'm oh. from fucking, I'm notorious for that. Like, <laughs> I, listen, I will left bound. I've heard left bound from him. I will whole, wholeheartedly admit I'm directionally challenged. Like, <laughs> yeah. I yeah. uh I've got I've got a ton of stories about that to tell, but it's nice when you, because you have the air unit. And so um I could just be like, hey, I don't know where I'm at. Just tell them where I'm at. Yeah. And then there, you would be like, Hey, he's over here. Or whatever. Yeah. Go, go to your left 10 paces. Yeah. Yeah. Your left, which isn't good. <laughs> I mean, it's it not is a good a, quality to have. It's just, yeah. it's, you know, uh, we, I just have it. I don't, I don't know. But we've talked about those green belts that we have. Some cities don't, some cities are pretty grid patterned, right? W- area. So you, you get into a wooded area, green belt, treed area, See, whatever you want to call it. It seems like flat grass. And no, it's not like, at all. You're, you're, you're describing an area to the viewers that is 
like where bicyclists go on a green belt. No. Remember how we talked no. about that argument and the thing where you kind of okay, yeah. stop it. I think everybody um, would agree. Okay. Yeah. So it's, e- it's super easy at nighttime to get turned around in there. Absolutely. I, f- I agree with you. This was on a city street, uh-huh. but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of them were on city streets. Dude. I've been rolling code to calls and like pass all the other units rolling code the opposite way. And I'm like, I'm going the wrong way. Dude. <laughs> other <laughs> north. 100%. I've done that. Dude. Yeah. Anyways. All right. We could talk shop. Oh, we could. All day. Yeah. Um, your first podcast experience. How was it? It's good. It's, uh, you know, kind of you leave yourself a little vulnerable. You're exposed. You know, you put yourself out there. Um, and hopefully anything I say, if it helps one person, that's cool. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, for sure. You know, uh, I enjoyed this. This is, and I'm, again, I, I'm going to say it, that this is very impressive, very professional. Um, and did you expect different? That's why I came in here. I told well, you. Coming I said, from me, you did. Just yeah, say it. Just say you did. I'm like, well, why is this thing not on like nine, you know, a, a, a tower of Coors Light cans and, uh. you know, where is your like Coors Light can? Uh, we're still waiting to get a sponsor by them. So oh, absolutely. You can't yeah. say their name out loud. Sorry. Yeah. So we were okay. hitting up Modelo's, I guess, but All right. well, you guys were here. But whoever wants to throw them our way. Um, so anyhow, you know, yes. the cool, the cool thing is actually a lot of the stuff in this studio and I'm going to say it, the table custom made, um, Kelly Woodworks canine handler at a local agency here. So, uh, go check him out. But he made this, he made our flag for us. Uh, mostly everything in here actually that's made, um, is actually police officers who own a business on the side doing stuff. That's so cool. we try to like support that. No, so that's, that's, cool. that's great. Yeah. No, I love the idea of this. I've, I've been a, a fan since you told me about it. Um, and I appreciate you having me on. Yeah, dude, it's been fun. I mean, I, I love talking shop. I know the listeners and the viewers, we get a lot of messages ask, asking for stuff like this, you know, so it was cool. Cool to be able to do it. Um, obviously we try to make all of this educational. So I think we threw some educational stuff in here, but also some fun storytelling. So and that's um, the thing you're going to be if you're ever caught, you know, when you get to be a cop is these memories and these stories. That's, totally. that's what it's about. Yeah. You know, the camaraderie and stuff that you, you build. And, and, uh, and I'm thankful, you know, that I got to do it with you guys. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, I can imagine, you know, like uh, we all say, Oh, you know, when I'm 50 or how, whatever, right. When you retire, like I'm out of this job and I'm never turning back. I think the one thing that's going to be the hardest is going to be this, like mm-hmm. the stories, going to work with your buddies every day, like doing the kick-ass shit. And then like all of a sudden you're not doing it anymore. It's done. Absolutely. I mean, that's going to be tough. There are certain aspects of this job where nobody else will fully understand what you've been through and what you do. Yeah. Unless they've actually done it. Yeah, um, I agree. You know, because we, we mentioned this on the last podcast I was on. There's certain aspects of this job that I don't share with my family because they don't need to know. It's, not, it's only going to bring them stress or worry. Yeah. Um, but you guys understand, which, yeah. which is awesome. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's your, that's my release. I'll have a t- conversation, have a talk or have a laugh. We'll move on. So that's super cool. Yeah. Any last, any, uh, is that your last words or, um, I don't know what else I'm going to say, but well, so I was going to say, usually we ended on like, Hey, if you could give any advice, like to the listeners, what would it be? But I think you get pretty solid advice. Well, and one thing I would say is to cops always go back to the why, like, why did you do this job? Yeah. That's, and I'm sure it's probably been said on this, so I don't know, maybe it's cliche, but um, that's the most important thing is why are you doing this job? And if you can remember that, or if you're you know, struggling at FTO, that's what's important to kind of reflect on and, and get, you know, kick yourself in the ass a little bit, figure out why you're doing this. And if it's for the right reasons and you want to do it, you know what? Get it done. Yeah. So. Um, I would say don't, don't lose perspective and be present. Um, it's very easy to dismiss a very simple call but always remember that that person that called the police spoke with dispatch because they needed a police officer to respond to their house yeah that's probably the worst day of their life or up there in the in in the worst day in their lives to so be present help them even if it's one of those civil matters that doesn't mean anything to you make make it important to them yeah for sure so um all right guys before we wrap it up we're gonna be in nashville i think it's august 25th through the 28th uh, head over to swatconference.org, get signed up. If you're not going to be there, we're going to be there bringing the podcast live to the conference. Like we did in New York. We got some really cool guests lined up. Um, other than that, I guess that's all I've got to say. Uh, thanks for tuning in guys. We will see you guys on the next one and cheers guys. Yeah, cheers. Yep. Cheers. See you guys.